I will apologize sort of up front. I have architects waiting there uh, for a one o'clock meeting down front, so I may just do that on a couple of weeks past one. Um, but she can certainly handle most anything. So let me kind of give you lay of the land um, in terms of where we stand. The trustees will tomorrow see a proposal um, that we um, begin to plan for the arming of all campus police officers um, on campus. Um, we have given a effective date of January 2016, did I get it right for a change, um, for that to take place. Um, what their vote actually is, and I'm looking at Jillian because she's a student trustee who's seen the vote, is that they authorize uh, the college to go forward in the preparation of a plan to um, implement that policy as of January 2016. So they're sort of approving that authorization to go forward and do the planning that will support that actually the plan itself as the AD has written um, would say that the plan would be subject to the president's approval, President Serino's approval. Um, so that's what they'll look at tomorrow. They will hear a presentation um, from the chief and I on that. Um, you know what we talked to staff about and with student government when we met a, a month or so ago with, with them was sort of the impetus for this because uh, that's the question we seem to be getting most often. Um, and, and again, we want to hear from you, so you can, can speak briefly. You're not going to get the full proposal of what we're going to present tomorrow night. Um, the chief will tell you the proposal that we will create will cover soup to nuts, everything from staff hiring, staff training, um, equipment acquisition, equipment storage, um, procedures, policies associated with any use of firearms on campus, certainly. Um, that it will, it will be that robust. And it, and it is not necessarily even in draft form now, other than sort of what the elements of that plan will need to be. Um, but the impetus for this really does um, sort of point to two things, and, and then I will defer to Karen as, as our as campus police chief to speak more about it. One, um, about two and a half years ago now, the trustees authorized Chief Kalamata to carry a firearm. She had been carrying since that time, um, and again, you know, with all the caveats that there's a, a, a memorandum of understanding with the Gardner PD um, in terms of her training and use of the firearm and all, all of those kinds of things. Um, this is an expansion of that. Um, I would tell you it's an expansion not based on criminal activity on our campus that necessarily points to the demand for the use of a firearm because a question that we've gotten is, you know, is crime on the increase, is violent crime, or is crime where you're carrying a firearm on the increase? Um, if you look at our statistics, which are public statistics related to um, campus crime, you will find that that is not the case. So, you know, I, I say that sort of as a, as a basis for going forward. What I would tell you that when you look at trends in campus policing, um, in community policing, um, it is a trend that you are seeing happen. Um, and I think the basis for that trend is the nature of the incidents that the officers are presented with. So um, have we had a situation where the chief has been you know, required to, to use her firearm? Absolutely not. Um, have we had situations where our officers have been in situations where that might have happened, where there might have been the demand, i.e. there was a threatening situation, or there was a situation that they required the backup of Gardner PD um, to address the situation, the answer is yes. Um, and, and I think that that's the part for me as a non-policing um, member of this staff that concerns me most, um, is that we do have a, a police force, and I use that word intentionally, because there are lots of campuses within the community college system um, that have security forces. There is a difference, and she will tell you more about that. Um, and there will be a bigger difference if this goes forward because their training will, will again um, expand beyond what the current training is for the police force. Um, it also concerns me that, it, that again, um, she, as the officer who currently does carry a firearm, um, does so without backup. And from a policing standpoint, there's a safety issue there in that a, a police officer would never either engage or, or safely uh, interact with the use of a firearm without backup, with appropriate backup. And again, I'll let, I'll let her speak more to what that is. So 
To some extent, this is preparatory. To some extent, this is following sort of what is a national trend, not a local trend. Although you would find within the, the community college of Massachusetts, there, there are two or three campuses now uh, where this kind of uh, proposal has gone forward. To my knowledge, uh, Massasoit Community College uh, police officers are armed. Um, that's the, the one I do know. I believe that's true of the state universities and, and, and perhaps the um, University of Mass system as well. But again, comparing apples and apples, I'm, I'm looking at our community college systems here in, in Mass. Um, and Bristol. Yeah, yeah. Greenfield, Holy, and Bristol. And Bristol, yep. Yeah. Have, have approval to go forward with the plan. Um, so that that is my, I guess, general um, kind of uh, response as to how this sits. I think that the hard work or the work that will be going on beyond any approval that might be granted tomorrow night by the trustees um, will be the work that, again, and part of that is community awareness and community um, information and, and letting the college community, because you folks as well as our employee base and our student base in general as to what that means you know and, and, and what that's all about so that's my brief I'll let, I'll let you talk to the brief too. I, I'm sure you know about the rest of the plan about where it's all going to be headed okay so let's present you mean from here or after a trustee's vote after the trustee's yeah. vote so after a trustee's vote does that have to be a unanimous vote or majority I believe majority I mean, unless they would call for something different. Typically speaking, I see majority with the trustees. Again, I defer to your student trustee, but um, no, there. No, no. Um, I don't recall there being a situation where the trustees were voting for the majority. No. A majority vote is typical for the trustees. I believe, as I would understand Robert's rules, they could call for that to be a unanimous vote if, if they so chose. Um, I've been going to the trustees meeting for probably a dozen years and never seen that happen. Um, that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. So that is I would, you know, the chair would make that decision for the trustees. Is it a simple majority or a two-thirds majority? Oh my goodness, you're gonna test my, <laughs> <laughs> test my Robert's rules knowledge. Um, I would, I would say simple majority, but again, I, I would agree with Jillian's comment in that I don't think I've ever even seen, again, in my dozen years, for a call of, of a show of hands or you know a recorded vote, so trustee Johnson voting X, so is that. I've never seen that happen. Um, it doesn't mean it can't. Um, it really is largely um, at the option of the chairperson to make that decision. So back to your question, Lynn. Um, where this goes, if they don't approve it, where this goes is I think nowhere, okay? Um, they might choose to approve something with a modified motion. Mm -hmm. So they might look at the motion, like or not like some part of that motion, and amend a motion. Again, I'm doing my Robert's Rules lecture here, Greg. I haven't done that in years. Um, keep training. Yeah, some tough keep, questions. keep trainers <laughs> with you. Um, <laughs> <and talk along. laughs> so, so they might amend a motion and change that motion if there's some part of that motion that they don't like. Presuming that they approve it in total or in full, what that would do then um, is sort of launch specifically for the chief, but myself in terms of the administrative side and, and again the rest of, of her officers to the extent that they're involved, the development of this plan. And, and again, I will give you sort of the broad reaching elements if that helps a little bit um, to give you a sense as to what that plan will include um, because we are going to talk to them about that. So there will be an element of campus community awareness where we work with our college community and again, perhaps with the local community on that. Um, well, meaning the jurisdiction that our campus police oh, officers have is it's limited to this. Put to the community that you're kind of. Forward. I don't mean the college community. I mean like local oh. Gardner, right? So where Gardner PD has jurisdiction over all of Gardner, but not necessarily on our campus. If they make a change to their policing, you know, their traffic pattern, they don't consult with us. Right. So if we make a change to our campus, per se, we're not required to no. speak with them. No. That's that's my point, sort of. But um, whereas with the wind turbines, we had an onus to do that because we were having an impact on, on that community that, that was going to affect the greater community in terms of the environmental effects. Um, personnel is another big piece of the plan in terms of training, hiring, um, psychological testing, those things. Um, cost and funding, there's a significant fiscal element to this in terms
terms of equipment, training, overtime, all of those kinds of things. Um, equipment, I've mentioned that a couple of times. I think that goes without saying, but I think it goes beyond sort of the firearms themselves to the peripheral kinds of pieces of equipment that go with that, the storage of that, the inventorying of that, um, the maintenance of that, okay, just, I guess, like a vehicle. I don't own a firearm, so I can't speak to those things, but there are things you have to do to maintain these pieces. Yes? When you say there's going to be a significant fiscal, fiscal investment, is that going to come out of the college's fund, or where will that come it from? It would come out of the college's fund. Okay. Yes. Does it say what that cap is going to be in um, issued firearm? I'm sorry, say it again? Is the official firearm listed in there? Have you decided? No. Which the firearm will be? Is it going to be a 9 millimeter, 45, what's going to be? No, it would likely be a 40 caliber because that is what law enforcement carries at this time. Um, the particular make and model we officially decided. Is that what you're carrying now? Yes. And those are details, Liz, I think they're, they're, they're good questions to ask, but those are absolutely the kinds of things <coughs> that are going to be worn out of a plan that are not necessarily done under the most of our knowledge of it. Um, the other two, again, very big things. One is training, obviously, um, for the officers um, associated with that. And then the other is policy. Um, and again, when I speak to policies, again, those are really policies that would dictate um, the officer's activities and the officer's responsibilities and duties um, associated with that. So those are not policies that are going to show up in the student handbook. Um, those kinds of policies, like the smoking policy you didn't hear from us about, um, these are policies that are related to personnel and, and to the operation of the firearm and, and their course of duty. So those are sort of the big overarching things that will be addressed in detail in a plan if it's developed. Okay, so a lot of times the questions we get are kind of the active shooter type questions. And, and this is in preparation for, you know, the worst case scenario, which we certainly hope will never happen. And we start to get a lot of those questions after the Sandy Hook and again after the, the Boston Marathon situation and people started when it gets close to their home they start going, you know what, we can't say it will never happen here. I hope I can say it will never happen here, but I can't make that guarantee. And so we we saw a lot more concern within the campus community um, for that type of a thing. In, in the um, proper police response to, to that type of thing, and quite frankly to any situation that may rise to the level of needing a firearm would be more than one officer. And in your worst case scenario, you want preferably four, but a minimum of three to go in as a team. Because what it, it has shown um, is that it, it's that the quicker the response, that immediate police response and putting the pressure on the perpetrator is what ends those situations in one way, shape, or form. Sometimes by their own hands, sometimes by law enforcement. Um, but quite frankly, there are a lot lesser situations than that that would require an armed response for the protection of an officer and for the protection of a student. You know, so, and, and I use this loosely, but a simple knife incident requires the presence of a firearm, which would require Gardner PD to come on campus to respond to that. And absent that, if somebody is trying to harm themselves, someone else, or the officer, without that, you're increasing the chances of all the parties involved being injured, um, if not injured um, with a serious injury, potentially even death. Um, people have raised questions about tasers. While the mass general law says you can't carry a taser unless you're first trained and carry a firearm. So even in the corrections world, your SWAT teams have tasers, your general corrections officers do not. That being said, even if we had tasers, it would not take the place of a situation that requires the potential firearm for protection. It would not take place of that. It would still require us call a Gardner PD for that call for us to go in on it. Absent this level of um, authority, we would have to simply be contacting, gathering information, calling 911, try to isolate a situation if we can, and call Gardner PD for that response. And that response time is what the concern is. Statistically speaking, and depending how they define it, um, whether they're defining the stats out there as mass murder or active shooter, are anywhere from eight to 12 minutes response time uh, that the incident is done. So New York 
uh, city did their study by the definition they use, they said in eight minutes, that active shooter situation or mass casualty situation is completed. Well, most recently, the deputy chief in Gardner was quoted in the Gardner News as saying he would estimate an eight minute response time for them to arrive. And that may be your first officer, and that's if they're available, because they're not always available. I think we like to think we dial 911 and that officer is readily available. But if that officer is on something simple as a three car motor vehicle accident, they can't abandon that patient. So they're not responding. And Gardner PD is very busy. So our response may be from the state police or Westminster. So then you're increasing that response time. The FBI statistics based on the definitions they used in their study was 12 minutes. So if we have right now on duty as we speak, we have myself and three officers, that's a team. If we are prepared and authorized and trained to respond, we can immediately respond and then Gardner and anybody else coming as our backup and they would still be called they're coming in as a secondary team to back us up and hopefully by the time they get here, we either have it isolated or if we don't, they're gonna join us with a secondary team to get it isolated, but we certainly have the opportunity to minimize um, the injury and minimize the response time to that incident because we can immediately deploy. And they could have one officer, you know, who knows where they're going to be and Gardner's a large city, so they could be on the opposite end of the city when they're responding, so all of that adds in the response time. So it's it's for any of those situations. And as Ann has said, we have had situations on campus. Thankfully, nothing that has risen to the need to use a firearm, but we have responded to situations where we should have had a firearm. In fact, a year or so ago, we had a situation where Gardner called us to back them up with something spilled over to our campus. And my guys had to try to team up while trying to establish a perimeter had to try to team up with the Gardner Police Department because they had a firearm. And it was actually our guys that ended up taking the guy into custody. Potentially dangerous situation for those officers. There what? are daily duties that they have that also put them um, at risk for not being armed with some of the duties that they have to respond to, not necessarily um, calls for service, so to speak. One thing that I will know, and again, it is different than, I, I would say, a residential and is that, you know, again, nationally when you read about community college officers being armed, um, the, one of the problems that our campuses present to police um, is that we're very open campuses. So anybody, and it does, as Karen said, um, things tumble onto our campus where they might not on a campus that's relatively closed. Now that's not true everywhere. If you went to Pittsburgh State, I would say the same thing, Pittsburgh State University, they're right in the throes of the city. Um, as are we, but we, we have so many community-based events and we have, again, a campus that is very open to anybody coming on campus. We, we oftentimes will even get a call for something going on in the cafeteria we'll, and, you know, my question is often if it's a student or employee and it's no, it's a community member and they're hanging out in the cafeteria. I mean, that's, that's the nature of our campus. That's not a bad thing, but from a policing standpoint, what that means is that we're very open. We're very exposed, I'll use that word. Um, to sort of things happening on our campus that um, would not happen necessarily on an, a campus that's a relatively closed campus if you went to a Merrimack College or you know some smaller campus that has a, has a real sense of closure to it. Not true of all. Um, but when we've read about and seen reports in the news on community colleges, oftentimes that's the case. You know, you'll have, for example, a domestic situation where there's a transfer of a, a child for a custodial visit or something. Um, and then there's a domestic situation that rolls out in the parking lot. Uh, that was a, a recent case. Again, that might not happen at your more traditional state university or college. I don't think it could, but it might not. Um, so you have those kind of things that, that tend to occur um, on our campus and community colleges more often. So we have, the other advantage to the campus police presence is twofold. The Gardner officers do not know this building like we know this building. So think of an officer that's showing up. Let's even go with the eight minute response time. Now they're waiting for their backup and we can't walk them through this building. So we are essentially trying to describe to them or show them on a map where to go if it's a, a situation that requires an armed response. So all the better that even if, we, let's say we only had two officers working, all it takes is that one officer, Gardner officer responded, we respond as a team, we train as a team. 
fact, have trained with Gardner police in safe police on active shooter response because that is what would happen in that type of a situation is you have joint teams. We can get them there more expeditiously because we know where room 182 is, we know where 072 is, and we know the students. We interact with the students. So we have a better chance of being able to talk a student down in a situation where we're familiar with that person. We may know them by name very many times we do in one way, shape, or form through our services, through working with student services, through working with counseling. Um, many people we, we do know and, and we do talk to every day and there's a big advantage in that. Just like the beat officer knows their beat and they know the people on their beat. And then employee, and employee base. base too. How often do you cross train with Gardner? Do you ever? Do they I do my, I do my um, annual fire do they ever come here and get a feel for what they do? They came here, we, we had a active shooter response um, drill here in 2007 um, and they trained with us and what they do is each time they do that type of thing they move from school to school so I've had that training twice when I was in Athol, I've had it here. Some of my officers were able to participate in that training because, and, and this is an important fact, 50% of my officers are officers protecting you out there in the cities and towns around you. So they're already out there doing this. They're already trained for this. They would still have to meet the same standards that we require for our campus, um, but they're already there and they've had that training. Um, so I did the, I also <coughs> did the active shooter response training with Gardner twice. Um, in different schools in the Gardner area in addition to this one and we've done the blue line trailer which is essentially an active shooter response with the screen. So when when they have it, which is not every year, yeah, um, say they we cross train they come them. here and, and yeah. get a Well they do the some but they, they also have to do the sense of their own building. So they have yeah. their own they're not well, I know there's an after shooter drill a couple months ago. Yep, yeah, we had that at one of their elementary schools. No, over at the hospital. Were you guys um, part of that? No, we weren't part of that one. Again, jurisdiction matters, and, and that's some of what Karen's, I think Gardner PD is, is that good neighbor for us. Um, by rights, they, they come by invitation, am I right? Right, um, yep. State police have jurisdiction on our campus, so mm -hmm. it's like we're come when we have property. Mm -hmm. um, who, again, come by invitation, but have really more freedom of jurisdiction here, even without invitation. Um, Gardner PD comes at our request, or in the event that something then they notify us of that presence here because they, they get that there is that boundary. But that boundary is not necessarily reciprocal so much, I guess, but I mean, in the event that, let's say, for example, and this has not happened so much, but that we had a situation that tumbled out into Gardner, we would notify them and look for their backup, but that would be their local, you know, we would expect they would be the primary law, official, law enforcement official in that particular case. Um, our folks would be responding only if something tumbled out and we knew it to be in the city of Gardner, Gardner would be that responding um, department. So it's a little, a little different. Yeah. When was the last time we had an active shooter drill on the Mount campus? I, you remembered, I'm glad you did. Yeah, yeah I, I participated as an observer as did President Screeno and a couple others from the Tech Council. Um, and then we had most of our officers at that time. Uh, and again, our force has changed um, since that time. It is something that you can ask for requests. Um, they are very costly, and as I learned that day, uh, very involved. Um, but they typically, um, you kind of get on a waiting list, as I understand yeah. it, um, to have that done. So 2012 was the last one. Do you have how many yourselves? Well, as far as what? Campus <laughs> police, as far as active <coughs> Well, right now my officers are trained for an unarmed response. They cannot respond. Their response is they lock so down, do they do get to a phone, they call 911. do drills? Yes, well, we do table talks more than anything, right? And as far as participating in a, a table talk is where you describe a situation, but you're all sitting around a table, and that's where the name comes from, and you say, what would you do? Um, so we did two this year, not for active shooter, actually one, one was, one, one was. Um, but basically where you roll out a scenario with the trainer and they say, this happened, this happened, this happened, what would you do? And that question gets posed to sort of everyone around the table. What you anticipate happening is different responses. So administrator says this, police says that, 
you typically would have fire at the table, you would have emergency response, and that you have all of the folks that are involved in that particular situation. Um, and then you proceed verbally kind of with what, okay, now you get news of X, Y, Z, now what do you do? Um, but you're not doing it physically, whereas in the active shooter, they were literally in our halls and, and doorways and such. But the officers who are not armed cannot do the active, active shooter of the full observe. scale drill. Okay. They can only observe. Right. The other officers, like I said before, when they've gone through it, have gone through it basically as representatives of the other police departments that they work outside of here. Uh, but we do regular training. We do extensive training. Um, the lists annually are, are generally a page long or more of all the training that my officers do. Um, we have a crisis response management training coming up next week. Um, so they are doing very frequent training. And many times my officers are trained beyond, you know, they do more training than some of the municipal departments. This would be though with different training, right? So right. what we're talking about if this goes forward is all the training she just described is what we currently do. And we'll still do, but this right, would be this would be No, luckily enough, that the not with a firearm, with not a with weapon, a fire. but not with a firearm. Yeah. I mean, well, we had threats, and we've been able to isolate and, and quickly take care of the situation that have had. So there hasn't been a need for a firearm. I wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a situation uh, two, three years ago. I lose track of time. Where a student was threatened with a knife in the North Cafeteria. Um, a knife situation would be a situation that would require an armed response. Luckily, we were able to get that under control and take care of that without having to involve more. But the likelihood is we could have walked into that situation and they could have had the knife with somebody's throat still, because that was what the original threat was. We were able to take the kid into custody quickly and, and thankfully, um, you know, without Gardner PD beating him. We had a situation, I believe it was last fall, that was what I referred to, where someone came on the campus community was reported to have a knife and that was the incident I was referring to where my officers had to respond unarmed which is a very dangerous situation for them and that's when he was at yeah. large so they weren't a student they were we had a situation that occurred at one of the fireworks um, events that we had it was a fight between two people who were from the community not from here who was here for the fireworks event and one of the two people involved in that event was someone that my husband had arrested for a stabbing just months before that. So the potential is there and my officers are responding and I'm responding to the, um, the difference is I'm armed and my officers are not. The other one that I'm- And I'm not always on campus. <laughs> the other one I'm remembering and, and we may have said this in our prior association was when we had a loan officer here in the evening on a weekend mm -hmm. and we had a person who had a mental health concern but also had a very large dog yeah. with them um, and was was doing property damage mostly but in a threatening way yeah. um, and very call for Gardner control. backup I mean we had Gardner yeah. PD who, who backed them up and that very well could have been right and and again you know it, it didn't go down that way but Gardner PD came you know and, and apprehended um, and that could have been not only on the part of the person but on, on the dog large, yeah, dog. large German Shepherd yeah shepherd. and that's and that why I guess more the fear yeah them. from a policing standpoint you know you often think gun versus gun right that's but with any kind of deadly force deadly force is deadly force and so it could be a knife and again it's, it's not infrequent that we have calls for knife situations they are generally um, not that somebody is wielding a knife so there's not a threatening kind of situation there but if so-and-so is out in a parking lot with a knife or so-and-so pulled a knife in a situation those are usually the kinds of calls that we get um, but again, going back to sort of that dog situation, if, if you have an animal that is vicious or attacking, and I'm not suggesting that it was necessarily, um, that can be as dangerous, you know, as, as that kind of situation. And again, that's where the officer's training and judgment, I use those words really carefully there, are really important, because they understand from a situational standpoint what does or does not demand that kind of response. Um, and that's what the training and all of that was. You know, we often have concerns from the Burns' office well, do we have a panic alarm? I said, the problem with a panic alarm is telling me one thing, an armed response, because it's an armed robbery, right? I don't have an armed department, which means if you're calling us because the student's yelling and screaming because they have to pay a bill,
bill that they don't think they have to pay, that we would have to treat it the same because there's no way for us to differentiate. You know, we, we often have those types of discussions. So it, and again, the more preparation in that sense. And it's interesting, but that question I will sort of take back again for staff works for students to hear. When that request comes forward, our answer is no, um, because it does demand that level of response. And if a bank does that, that is, you know what I mean? If they push that panic button, that means they're being robbed. And so our response to them is, you know, you can have alternate means of communicating that you need not to respond, but not the panic button, because that very much implies that kind of a response. So that that's the level of sort of caution with which we're proceeding, is that we're not, you know, as she said, and I usually say mine, because I'm the non-police officer in this situation, I hope the officers never have to use their firearms. And, and I mean that, you might say, well then why bother? Well, for the protection of the officers and the protection of the community is why you bother. You never, I think, hope that that's gonna be the situation, um, but we have to be realistic about the fact that it might be. Now what kind of situations would an officer be authorized to discharge their firearm? And would they require authorization, or would it be left up to the responding officer's discretion? No. Well, when I use the word discretion loosely, because it's that's based on training. Did, did they? And they they don't even use the word continuum anymore. But I'll use it because that's the old police term for it, kind of a continuum of force. You don't use lethal force unless lethal force is required. It doesn't mean you don't have it present just in case. So a knife incident would require the presence of a firearm for the protection of all persons involved in case it leads to that level. That does not mean the firearm ever comes out of the holster unless it is required to come out of the holster. And certainly um, in, in this type of atmosphere, we would be employing a whole nother level of judgment to, you know, if you're outside in a forest or street, you know, because you have a lot of people in the building, but that's all training. That's all comes under the, all that umbrella of training that's you know multifaceted that Anne was referring to and, and defensive tactics and when you employ different levels and there's no when I say they take the word continuum out of the old way of teaching it was you go from A to B to C to D that's no longer how it's taught it's taught the way it was meant to be is that yeah if pepper spray can take care of that person with a knife certainly you use pepper spray but if pepper spray can't you may have to jump to the firearm if that threat gets to a point where you feel like if I don't take action, somebody is going to get hurt or die here. So that's that's what that defensive tactics training would employ is that training. And, and that would be regular training along with all the other training, the annual trainings on the firearms, et cetera. So, you know, a, a good case in point, it was a, a call that Gardner PD recently went on and my husband was involved in it. For those of you who may not know, he's a Gardner officer. And the call involved someone who had left the courthouse, went home, called his girlfriend, said he was gonna harm himself. Three officers got there, three officers on duty. So this is a call where none of the Gardner officers are available to respond if we had an incident here. Three officers on duty, they cannot leave that call. They locate him in the bathroom, he's in the bathtub, he had already harmed himself. He had already, um, badly cut himself with a knife, verbally threatened to stab the officers, said that he had a second knife in the tub, which they could hear when he moved his feet, they could hear the clinking of it, and in fact jumped up and tried to stab my husband. My husband rolled to the floor. Now the other officers have their firearm drawn. My husband has a taser. One officer on duty has a taser. He has the taser. They make the assessment that they're going to try to use the taser, but in trying to use a taser, the other two are ready to use lethal force if they have to. We never want to. He's able to get in a position, hit the guy with the taser. The other officer, when they stiffen up, when you hit him with the taser, is able to grab the arm and get the guy into custody without any harm. But that's an example of you would never go into that situation without the firearm, even though you didn't want to use it. So Does that make sense? So lethal force would be the absolute last option. Right. Always would be. Always would be. And again, it would either be for the protection of others, the protection of the officer. Um, you know, but but yeah, and that and that's where you know Karen described some good situations, I think, for you. It is very situational. There are protocols, there are standards that you apply, but you apply it differently depending upon the situation that the officer is engaged in. 
You may have a situation where that door is open and I can distract her over here and sneak up behind her and hit her with pepper spray, right? But you're not going to do that without the presence of being able to react if she then perversely reacts and tries to stab me. Do you have tasers here? Do we have, uh, no, what you, the part you missed okay. is that you cannot have tasers in Massachusetts okay. without first having a firearm to be a trained firearm. It's okay. state law. Now I'm going to devil's advocate. I'm going to step out if that's okay, yeah. unless you want me to stay for this question. Well, yeah, I can. Kind of, okay. um, I'm not building the building, but I'm helping. <laughs> I'm not naive enough to believe this is not already a done deal. But as a representative of student government, I need to present I've had a lot of students and some professors come up to me who are against this idea for a multitude of reasons. Um, but I promised I would voice their, their concern. And I'm surprised that people aren't here. I mean, I talked to a lot of students and they're, they're upset about it, but obviously not upset not to be here. Now, but that's, I think that's kind of typical of uh, So I, I just want to give, and I believe me, I've gone through firearms training. I'm not opposed to you or a couple of people on duty at a time, day and night, to have it, but I just feel like everybody carrying guns is kind of sending the wrong message to the students and to the community. Are you telling them, I'm a resident gardener too, and are we telling them people with gardeners that we're afraid of the people in the community that all of a sudden, are, you know, nothing has happened in 50 years here and all of a sudden. No, that's not true though. No, but I mean, there has not Never been had a shooting. Based on God help us if we get to that point. But. No, no. I mean, but that could happen at soccer show. So it could happen anywhere. Well, exactly. You can't have a lot of worrying about what happened. And based <coughs> on the Clary Act, is that, am I saying it right? There has been no violent incidents on campus. Well, I wouldn't say, say with that. A, with a weapon. I wouldn't say that either. And, and but you have to be careful with the Clary statistics. Now, I think you will find when we had that knife incident in the North mm -hmm. Cap that was a threat with a mm -hmm. weapon, that's listed as aggravated assault. Other knife situations we would have on campus would not show on the Clery Act because in order for it to come out on the Clery Act, when you're looking at the disciplinary end for weapons, mm -hmm. we only count the weapon stat, this is by federal, federal definition, if the weapon itself is an illegal weapon. So if it's you're carrying a jackknife, that's going to be disciplinary, or a box cutter, that'll be disciplinary, but it won't show in the Clery Act because it doesn't show in the Clery Act unless it's one of the 10 right. weapons that in the definition of mass is a felony by the fact that you nunchuck, mm -hmm. double-edged knife, switch blade, any of those things. The only so they can be deceiving in some way. I, I just want you people to be aware there, are, there is some... I'm all happy that you're carrying a gun. I can see another person day and night. It's, to that point, Lyndon, I How about like an arsenal that you have access? Okay, so if arsenal. here's my problem with that, and, and I'll just use an example. So if I'm standing in this room right now and I don't have a firearm, and somebody right there is with a firearm, I have to get that door, block it, get downstairs, try to make my way to my office or down to the arsenal to get the gun to come protect you with that firearm. But what if you're... Uh, I could be in the I president's mean, complex I and the firearms are downstairs. Else, right? and, so. and I really, I, I want to, and, and we want to hear, so I say that right up front, we want to hear differing opinions. And, and, and I would not necessarily agree with you. This is a de facto, I got to be frank, we have to present for the trustees. I have no idea what the that. trustees are going <laughs> to say. How long have they been prepared for this vote? You heard at the beginning, I mean, you guys have been your packets three weeks, two weeks, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have a lot of other information other than what has been presented there. Um, and they've never, as far as I know, engaged in a, a conversation amongst themselves unless they've done it out of our earshot, which they might have, um, about that. So I have to be very frank with you. I don't know where that's going to go tomorrow night. I just want you to know there is some. Yeah, no, we well, appreciate that. Yeah, I've heard yeah, both from the staff and from yeah. students, and yeah. I've done, done my own mini survey, and I've had like people who think you should be carrying food beans and people, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not looking for food beans, I'm not even looking for shotguns. Quite frankly, anything that requires a long range weapon, I'm going to be asking Gardner TV to bring that. Well, we just want to and be that's prepared another, for that immediately. I know, before. I know, I understand. I know it's, it's and to, the way of the world. My concern is the safety. You got a cement building here and bullets are going to be ricocheting off of, and you got a daycare center across 
the way there. I, I'm thinking more of a safe. But that all that comes even if somebody came in here with a bazooka, it, it's it's yeah. no way. But truly, that's where, and I think Karen was real specific about that. The kind of training, right, that a person would receive regarding engaging in, in the use of a firearm on a college campus is going to be mindful of the things you just oh, mentioned, sure. like the fact and that you've you got time, you could have a thousand people in the hall. Right. I mean, the kind of
purpose is to take professional trained police officers and give them all the tools capable of defending you or this campus in any given situation and limiting the response time should that situation. So having it in like an armory somewhere in like a central location building, you don't think that would be like better than having it? Like at what point, there's a lot of kids here, I don't know whoever, I don't know who's saying who's not, what could happen, but what, what point does it become more dangerous for you to have that? Like with a group well of again, that, that goes back to um, equipment and the training. If you're referring to someone taking the officer's gun away from them, mm -hmm. um, the, the type of equipment that is used and the training that is employed minimizes that risk. And, and that's all part of the plan that we're that we want to implement is minimizing all of those here, risks. Sometimes they come back from deployments and they're not all there like they were. They have all the training done, but maybe more. And if they snap, someone's gonna have an ass, you know? But why would you, wouldn't it be safer to have it somewhere in like a good location and like if you need it, your response time would be a lot faster than the police department and yet they'll have it here. Well, it may be, we may be able to get to the weapon if we can get to the weapon still quicker than it would take Gardner PD to get here. I don't think we can necessarily say unequivocally one way or the other, depends on where we are and if we can even get to it. But certainly, if we're in the area of the situation, running the opposite way to get the weapon certainly would defeat the purpose. And it would still require all the same training and expense and equipment, whether or not we had them on our person or in an arsenal. I was just going more towards the safety thing than what you're saying, like the intimidation thing. Is, I, I don't like it there. You know, I, I don't know who's here that is having a bad day, that bad of a day that maybe them and their friends are in a little group and they don't, they're really just pissed off about something and they, and they decide, hey, I see that gun right there. Yep, we're taking that. And, and people have made that argument and, and quite frankly, the opposite argument has been that if they're already thinking that, then where are you already at? Yeah, you well, potentially already at that, that lethal yeah. force situation if that's even the, where they're going. And more likely than not, they're gonna have the weapon if that's their mind frame. Um, um, I know you had said there was no increase in crime Again, it, it's that officer backup. So um, it's that officer perspective. You have two officers. Now they might attack me or they might attack that officer. That officer may be in a better position to employ whatever weapons they have than I have. Um, so if I'm the one in a tactical position to use my pepper spray, I can't have both of my hand at once. So maybe that officer is my cover officer with the firearm while I'm trying to employ a less than lethal technique. But remember, pepper spray and even tasers, that, you know, people ask, well, you're going to be within six feet of that person. Someone has a knife, and, and they've actually, I think, done studies since where they've changed it, but in the old school, they taught us the 21 foot rule. If someone's in 21 feet of you, they can stab you before you can even draw your firearm. So you're not going to get within six feet of them to employ pepper spray or a taser or any other kind of weapon, baton, or whatever the case may be unless you can get into a strategical um, location to maybe sneak up behind them or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Now over the past couple of years, there have been a lot of news stories. Some have been high profile, some have been low pri profile about security guards, about police officers, about various, uh, various authority figures who were armed responding to a situation that didn't require deadly force by with deadly force. Um, there have been high profile stories about unarmed individuals being killed by armed police officers um, who didn't really need to respond with that kind of force. So what kind of assurance do we have that such an incident wouldn't happen on campus if we were to arm the police? Well, well I, want, I want you to clarify. So you're saying that the high profile cases you're talking about were unarmed officers no, no, no. Uh, armed, officers armed officers and unarmed, unarmed uh, individuals that they were responding to. Okay, and who was killed in that scenario? 
Well, the first one that comes to mind was, I think it was a few months ago, um, a mentally ill homeless man who was squatting in an abandoned building out in uh, California okay. was, uh, was killed by two officers who responded. I don't remember what the response was, but I remember he was unarmed and they handcuffed him and they essentially beat him to death. Well, I mean, I, I guess I would say, and again, I go back to, and I, I don't know that particular case, mm -hmm. um, it goes back to that officer's judgment or those officers, if there are multiple officers involved, judgment in any particular scenario. So I guess I would always um, hesitate to comment on what that person's mindset was given all of the circumstances that were occurring at the point in time. I mean, obviously there are internal investigations to look at any of those cases when something happens that is allegedly um, not appropriate use of force. Um, that would be true everywhere. I, I look at somebody like Sean Collier, who was an MIT police officer, I believe that's an armed force. Um, he was ambushed by all intents and purposes by those two individuals allegedly um, and killed nearly immediately. Now he was an armed officer, obviously, who was unable to, given the nature of that situation, defend himself with firearms. So I think it's it's understanding sort of that the police are trained to make those decisions as those decisions unfold. And again, I think the chief's description of the situation that happened with Gardner PD um, is a good one, and that you had two officers prepared to use lethal force, one officer who was not, he was using something less than lethal force to address the situation, but there was a plan A and B in motion at the same time. They never had to get to the lethal force. That would always be that preference, right? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, frankly, of a, you know, a situation that we had maybe a little less than a year ago, I think, um, in the summertime when we had someone with a motor vehicle who was operating the motor vehicle on our campus erratically in such a way that there was a threat to life and, and safety on campus. Now, if that was a public street or if that was, now nah, here's a different situation, if that was a back road, okay, um, an officer might first take their vehicle and block that erratic vehicle with their vehicle using that as a form of protection. But in the event that that didn't happen, there might be a time when they use the firearm to try to disable the vehicle, not the individual, right? So I'm using that firearm for a different purpose. On our campus, and Karen can tell me because I only associate with police <laughs> officers, I'm not one. Um, that may be, I don't think we would ever use a firearm in that situation, given the level of pedestrian traffic that we have on campus. Um, I think that that would be an inappropriate use of force in that situation, unless that person was presented themselves no with that, with no other option. Now that, that would be sort of a, you know, an escalating situation, but frankly, you know, people were in fear that this person was gonna run over pedestrians because of the nature of the way they were operating this vehicle campus and I had an officer involved in that situation that, that this person would not respond to his verbal cues and other cues to stop that vehicle so I'll, I'll defer to you because <laughs> you didn't have to be there doing it and I only had to read about it but um, but I mean that to me was a life-threatening situation that we had on campus yeah and truthfully any use of force and use of force can be my hands my feet it could be my pepper spray it could be a baton it could be any one of my weapons any use of force is is reviewed and then you determine was it under the totality of the circumstances justified or not under those circumstances that again to, to mitigate those risks you're talking about initial training you're talking about ongoing training you're talking about retraining on, on things that the officers have already been trained on so that they have that education for those to make that correct judgment in the situation. In the example that Ann used, you absolutely, as a very last resort and only when you absolutely have to ever shoot at a moving car. Like that would not be something that you would ever want to do as a primary response. It doesn't mean under certain circumstances it wouldn't be justified and it has been justified, but that would all require review with a review board that would all be part of the policy that every single use of force, including from your hands to any weapon on you up to a firearm, be reviewed, be reviewed independently and an assessment made. I mean, again, you're, you, the assessment
assessment's going to be made, but you would hope that it would never come to you that it's unjustified. The situation you described, I can't answer to that. I won't answer to media type things that have limited information. Many of those cases, not all, I'm not going to tell you that there aren't mistakes made out there, but the majority of those cases, the officers are cleared when it comes down to that investigation on justified versus unjustified in the totality of the circumstances facing them at that time in the judgment that was employed. Um, past that, I think it's, it's very difficult to say based on limited information you see in the media when you're, you're typically seeing one side and the other side you don't hear because you know they're not gonna talk about it, especially in that investigatory stage. Um, so you're only gonna kind of hear the one side or the outside of the issue. I'm just wondering if you have a ballpark figure for if this is approved, how much it would cost the school for the training? Do you have any idea at all? Well, ballpark is a range yeah. because the majority of the overtime, if we can space it out appropriately, can be diminished to on duty. Some of it can't be, there's going to be some. Um, so I would say in the range of 12 to 15,000 would probably be the low end with weapons and training and doing it the majority of the training on, um, on duty. No, the officers aren't police officers. So they're already police officers. We're just trying to, to give them the tools to do their job. You know, the analogy I like to make is you have a carpenter, you send them to build a house, but you don't give them a hammer. You know, they, they can't completely do the job. We're trying to give them the additional tools to completely do the job, but they're already police officers. You're not going from security officers to police officers. Again, I have to go to work soon. I, I just feel we're giving ourselves a false sense of someone's bound and determined to come and handle harm, your PC is not going to stop them. If they come in with a semi-automatic or an automatic weapon, nothing that you can do, none of your drills are ever going to prevent mass I don't death. disagree. I don't think you should disagree. I don't so disagree I that you can prevent a, a, it. The a idea is to minimize it. security, but increasing the risk of something accidental happening. Like I said before, I could understand you and maybe another person on your side with the defendants. Every shift carries that. I, I gotta say that I use this word sparingly. I think it's overkill to have everybody carrying it. Just for the increased sense of danger. With little kids around here, the public here, day and night. Um, another thing is, the, uh, it's nothing disparaging to you guys, but the Mount Observer article was horrendous. It gave the students as a whole a false sense that we as a student government supported this. So we're kind of disparaging. I don't know if you saw it on in the newspaper. Did you read the article? I didn't see the whole article until first. And it called you guys security guards, and, and I posted something on Facebook, on Facebook saying that's an insult to you guys. You're not security guards. You're trained as the state police are and everybody else corrections, and I appreciate that. But I think we're giving everybody, faculty, staff, and students a false sense of security, believing that your gun is going to stop anybody bound and determined anywhere, stopping I'd actually like to build. I'd actually like to build on her question. She was saying, you know, with the handguns, they won't be very effective against someone who comes in armed with more heavy-duty fire fire uh, power. Would there be more? Would there be more heavy weapons somewhere on campus in case of, say, someone coming in with an assault rifle? Would there be heavier weapons? on campus somewhere that could be accessed or would it just be the sidearms? That is not the intention at this time. Gardner PD does have access to um, larger capacity firearms for long distance. Again, it would be, we would try to stop the threat or, or mitigate the threat, um, hopefully stop it before they arrive, but certainly keep it a perimeter until they arrived in the case where we needed a long arm. 
something that reaches further. Um, but we can't even do that without the, the firearm. We can't even do a perimeter control. Typically in police response, whatever the situation is, you secure your inner perimeter, your outer perimeter, right, and you build out. We can't secure the perimeter if we're not armed. So we can't even try to isolate the incident to keep it in the wet more wing until Garner gets here so we can get, for instance, a long arm. If we're not armed, they could get anywhere near the building. Whereas if we're armed, we can try to at least contain the incident, you know, until they arrived if we needed other type of weaponry. But at this point, I would not be looking to adding shotguns or AR-15s or anything to this campus. I think the, your question is a good one in that it does go to sort of what are we preparing for? And, and I would say that, you know, just as um, local police um, or state police have varying levels of response and ability and call upon others to back them up. I mean, use the Boston Marathon bombing as a good example. Um, in virtually very little time, it went from a local incident to then, you know, sort of a state incident, then to a federal incident over a course of hours. So any situation that would demand a stronger response than, than what the chief was projecting for what they're doing would also demand response that was broader than what a local force, meaning our local force here at Mount Wachusett would have to respond. But it does speak to sort of the nature of what policing um, and security, and I don't mean that from a security guard standpoint, um, but, but calls for, which is sort of an expansion and extension of that, depending upon the level of concern that is raised. Now, where, what's it saying? If somebody came in with a firearm, obviously if they want to do something, it's, it's going to happen. I work in corrections. Everybody, where well, you are, is going to cooperate. It could be like the same thing as people just free roaming everywhere, doing whatever. Some people intending on, some people not. And like, I feel like the training was nice. We do a direct report down a lot. Just training. Well, like, I was giving you the them. examples of what we have actually seen here or respond to here. Yeah. But, but you certainly have different response options in, in a relatively isolated area, whereas this isn't, and it's an open campus. Best analogy I can can give you. That's that. not necessarily true. Yeah. I'm a retired correction officer, and we have a lot of disgruntled family members coming to our clinic, mm -hmm. and not every correction officer is armed. They're trained, but they're not armed, and there's extensive armory. And that must be the protocol. I'm presuming this is a Commonwealth property. Yes, correct. So there's somewhere in that correctional but you have institute where those inmates that are ready to respond if they need to. Well, within but we don't have that. We don't even have that here, right? Well, that's why I'm saying a couple yeah. of you, if it's not across the board that every correction officer is armed on duty, or maybe two, out of permanent security, because you do have a lot of people coming onto the property, much like this, who have an agenda, but it doesn't mean every single person is armed, either in the perimeter and, of course, not inside. And, and people who are coming into your perimeter, there are certain provisions for Shirley, so it's a quite extensive right. property, and people come onto the perimeter all the time, and there's been a few times they've come armed. Oh, I, I'm not disagreeing with that, but I'm saying that this is an open campus compared to what is somewhat of a controlled area. Well, not the whole bomb, but surely not the whole area. No, 
that when we're talking about hiring, we're talking about replacement officers for the future. Um, you know, typically on your day shift, which is when our biggest population is here, we have three to four officers if you count myself on at a time. Um, second shift, you have two to three on the weekends and, and overnights. You often have weekends you have one overnights, one sometimes two on an overlap. Um, we're not looking to increase that. Of course, if President Suda does get dorm someday, that would be the reason for the increase, not arming officers. Um, but the point is, is, is that you have position officers on duty, especially during the, the two shifts Monday through Friday that are um, where our typical populations are here that would be able to respond and, and provide themselves with a backup, even if it's during interim or wait for guys to come in and do shifts. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. I just have a question about reception of this new uh, policy. Now, uh, obviously, over the past week or so, there has been some controversy about the about the reception of the proposal um, about how the uh, you know depending on who we've spoken to, the SGA has been on board. Depending on who we've spoken to, they have not been on board. I was wondering if you could give me a statement on how you found the reception of this proposal to have been in general as far as amongst the student body, the, uh, the various bodies that are in control, administration, faculty, students, the SGA, all of them? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry? It doesn't matter. I know. Because I wouldn't be standing in front of the room. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I mean, would the trustees interfere with? If the trustees don't, well, you asked me that question, okay? Come on. Um, but if they don't ask me that question, I'll be surprised. I have a slide in this that will be revised after this meeting that addresses the kinds of questions that we responded to and the kinds of questions that the college community have asked. Um, so it does matter, I need to say that. Um, does that matter and will it influence the trustees vote tomorrow? I suspect it will. I suspect they're gonna ask me that question. I'm prepared to answer it and that's why we're doing this. To, to your point in terms of who I heard from and that's pretty much the only thing I can I mean, I guess generally speaking with the SGA, and again, you all have minutes that are SGA members to reflect what, what happened in that meeting. Um, I feel like they, we responded to questions around it, much as we are here, um, concerns, you know, you name it. I, I don't, I, I didn't walk away from there going, oh, the SGA is on board. That, that wasn't my impression. I, my impression was there are people who were concerned about it. There are people who think it's okay. Um, hopefully we gave some good answers to give them more information about that. Um, I would say largely that's how I feel about the employee base too. Um, I was saying to somebody earlier, we've had two forums. At one forum, we've had just about 30 or so um, staff and employees that attended that. Um, and we fielded comparable kinds of questions related to that. Um, we also fielded questions related to sort of their own personal safety in their offices. I think the example the chief gave in, in regards to that safety button or something like that. Um, we have certain offices that feel a little bit more threatened than others given the nature of their work. So I think that, that we heard some of that. Um, the second forum that we had, I believe we only had eight or nine people at, so we had a much smaller attendance there. Um, the other place we've gotten feedback, not surprisingly, um, is in our email, in our, in our inboxes. Um, and I know that um, President Squino has shared a number of those with me. I have received some of those myself. We definitely received a lot of uh, feedback okay. via email yeah. on the subject. I mean, a, a lot of people are either they feel more comfortable doing things that way mm -hmm. or they can't make a form. I mean, it doesn't matter to me how you get the feedback as long as you get it. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is that generally with a few um, of the staff, there has been a level of sort of engagement, meaning they've wanted questions answered and I've answered those questions and then there's been Either I think this is a great idea or I think it's not a great idea. I've, I've gotten some of both. Um, in other cases, there are very strong opinions um, that have been counter to this. I don't agree with this. Um, I think the, the one faculty member that I'm thinking of that was at one of the forums said, um, and I'm not quoting here, but you know, I don't agree with firearms. I don't agree with the, the sort of the proliferation of firearms in our society in general. He really spoke to sort of his general principles related to that um, and he just wanted his voice to be heard regardless of whether or not this went forward or not and and so that that was good that was respectful I think that that's important to know um, that we have people with different opinions um, going forward in there um, so I've heard everything you know what I mean in different forms from different folks um, and I think it 
it does matter. Um, but I guess I would say, because I think you and I talked about the smoking policy before, in the same way that I know that when I change a smoking policy, I'm going to people go, eh, I, don't, I don't agree. I think we should, you know, I had all sorts of, why aren't we smoke free? Why don't we let anybody smoke on campus? You know what I mean? There are people that disagree with that policy. Um, we made the decision we made. We went forward with that once that was approved. Um, so, you know, I, I suspect that that will continue regardless. I mean, if the trustees do not vote this forward, there will be people saying, well, I disagree with that. I think we should have had firearms. If it gets full, voted forward and the plan develops, there'll be people who are opposed to that. And I, and I think, you know, that's why we have the levels of governance and the levels of authority that we do for different things. But it's also why we look for input. And it's why this plan really does contain a level of education and community outreach so that our campus community, in the same way that Greg and, and Dean Zaleski did a lot of outreach related to the smoking policy, we would see us do that under this plan so that the college
Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't do more forms and get more information. I think that's a good idea. I'm happy to do that. Um, and, and I mean it dif differently than just a general form, you know, <coughs> as we proceed, if we proceed with it, I think there's an obligation for us to really educate and make people aware. I mean, we didn't just talk about, here's, here's where the gazebos are for the smoke there. Um, we talked about the effects of, of tobacco, really. It's, it, and, and again, people questioned with that one, just the policy, because it was sort of a smoke-free facility, not a smoke-free campus. Um, and, and so there was a lot of conversation, but it was, it was educational in nature. And I think if we proceed with this, that's what you're gonna see happen. But in advance of us proceeding, I think getting more feedback is, is fine. I'm happy to do it. Kathy, and then. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to speak to your um, question regarding yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just want to reiterate that, you know, when, when the, the issue with Donald and Chief Kramer came to CSJ, that was the first time that this was being presented to us. So we were, I know the article had said that we were proposing this. No, that was not the case by far. Um, and they were coming to get our feedback as representatives of the student body, which in turn, which is why we brought it to the SGA group and we tried to hand out the proposal to students and, and let them be aware of this forum, which is what I requested that we have a student forum. And as you see, you know, we've got three student government members here. I know where Liz stands. I don't know what, what um, Jillian's thoughts are. I know that I'm in favor of the policy. So you potentially have three different, you know, positions here. So and the I'm, SGA doesn't have an anonymous, no, uh, anonymous no, we did not. Unanimous. We had no vote taken, so there's no official stance from the SGA. So anything you hear from an SGA member, I know that I was quoted as the SGA president. That was my opinion. personal opinion. I wasn't speaking on behalf of the SGA. And, and I we didn't make that clear. Yeah, we weren't looking for endorsement either. So I gotta, I gotta be frank about that. It was informational and it was sort of, a, we're just making them aware. We want you, again, the request from Kathy was, can you guys produce us something so we can raise awareness on campus and, and do that, which, which we did. Was there another? Did I miss it? I just have one more question. Uh, the vote, the vote tomorrow from from the trustees. Is that going to be the official go ahead versus shilling it, or is there going to be more past that to decide on whether or not the uh, the policy will go forward? Um, I will read you. I'm not sure. I don't know. You know, I'm looking at you from a governance standpoint. I think I have the AD in my. Always the final vote unless it's amended. But what I'm wondering is, I'm not sure it's public. You know what I mean? Because you guys haven't reviewed it yet. So it's it's to look for, I'm not going to use the actual language in case I'm not supposed to do this, but um, it's to look for the approval and authorization for police officers, not which is intent to carry firearms in the context of their employment pursuant to the development and implementation of training certification process approved by the college president. So it would approve the development of that plan and process that would support that um, there is actually no date of implementation involved in that as well. Um, but again, I, I really need to say this because it is not unusual. In fact, it's somewhat common. I don't think you've seen it so much this year, but I have through the years. Um, for them to look at what is being proposed and amend that, just as the student government might amend a motion that's on a floor. Um, so I, I have to be frank with you, anything could happen. Um, they could just vote this down as totality, which is one option. Um, they could approve it in its totality, or they could look at it and say, you know what, we really think we want this to go forward versus this. Um, any one of those dynamics could happen. Um, would you feel more comfortable if you had at least one officer on duty who was armed all the time, or would you feel that you would want that to work out the entire group? Well, I think it doesn't solve what we have now. That, you know, if you don't have the whole force any one of those officers can be dealing with something. I can be tied up on one call while they get called to another and I can't respond. So I, I, I don't think it changes much different than what we have now where if I'm not on campus, I'm not on. So what about if they ask the officer to respond? Well, I think again, you always have that situation that any one of those officers could respond to a situation and be the unarmed officer and or be unable to back up that other officer. So there's only three of you as it is. If there were three issues going on, that would create the need more staff. Like, I don't know. Don't ask <laughs> 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 Yeah, I mean, I think 
So like this is just a serious level to have every, every office around here having a weapon on them. It's like three is really sufficient if you're gonna have something that could be like life threatening right there. Life threatening at any point. Well I, your your typical situation of three to four officer team and in many situations a two officer team is sufficient to handle those situations. Obviously the larger the incident, the more people and there may take eight people to handle a large scale incident. Um, but we could at least be that initial responding team to, to try to minimize and um, isolate that incident while more come if more are needed. So, you know, I mean, and you're right, you're not gonna send in two officers, but those two officers may be able to do something to, you know, isolate into one area and, and keep others back from going into the danger zone while other people arrive. So, it's hard to answer that because every incident is different. You know, a domestic violence situation, police protocol is at least two officers. You don't go into even a domestic violence situation at all. And I can tell you right now, we have 20 restraining orders in our book downstairs for people on this campus. Now, if that victim, so to speak, right, was to move out and so the um, defendant doesn't know where they're living, but they know where they go to school, where might show up. And so that's a situation where you never go into a domestic unarmed, you never go into a domestic with less than two people. And if, okay, so Mike Ledoux is my other armed officer and he's up on life flight and Jim Halco is now my backup, well now he's not armed. Now we're back to this whole situation. So, I mean, it's a good question. I understand where it comes from, but it doesn't much change. And you would still have to train and have firearms for the whole department. Right? So that part of it wouldn't lessen because you don't know who your combination of officers is going to be. I can tell you who it is today, but tomorrow one of them could call out sick and it could be the other untrained, unarmed officer who is now the officer on duty. So this, they're hard questions to answer in hypotheticals because every hypothetical can have a different answer. And the same hypothetical with a little twist to it can change. <laughs> Good answer. I was going to say, we thank you for your input. We thank you for being here. Sometimes people focus on who's not here um, versus who is here, but um, you guys took the time, you offered honest opinions. Hopefully, you, you've seen that, that we want that, um, that we really are not looking to sway or influence a decision so much as just make people aware. Um, and, and frankly, um, we're happy to do that more to the extent that we're able to, um, you know, before anything goes forward, um, and to the extent that we can get students involved in that. Um, so I don't, I don't know what that is going to be, but I will also commit to you that if something does get through, um, that you will see more of that activity going on because we want folks to be aware of things and not to be surprised by things. Um, I, I said to, I think either Greg or Jim Gillespie that. Um, policy, we um, gazebos in early because we had bad weather coming and we wanted to get them in and get them installed. And I said, you know, hindsight is 2020. It was the best thing I ever did because when we finally announced the smoking policy, they went, that's what the gazebos were for. So there was a sense of sort of purpose to what that is. Um, you would not see that happen with firearms. People will know they're coming. Um, it won't be the gazebo situation again. But I said the good news was people had an awareness of something being on campus, then they understood its purpose. I think the important thing here is that people understand the purpose before, and then they raise awareness before something actually arrives. So I, I'm, I'm gonna use my, my smoking analogy there. Mm -hmm. um, would there be a way to postpone the board decision just so there was more to the awareness? The board could do that. You could bring that forward tomorrow as a student. Sure. As a trustee, I would say. That they input the irrecusal from the student body of 